screen sharing. Yeah, so today we're gonna discuss traveling salesman problem, but basically this is a, a chapter on uh, finding global minimum with simulated annealing. And traveling salesman problem is just uh, maybe one of the simplest examples uh, of, uh, uh, of this problem of finding a uh, global minimum of a complicated function. Um, we discussed last time that uh, there are three issues in the simulated annealing. One is uh, how to anneal, or basically how to change the temperature slowly enough uh, uh, so that uh, we don't get trapped into a local minima. Uh, and the second one uh, problem, the, sec the second most important problem is how to uh, construct good uh, steps which will efficiently move us uh, in the phase space. Um, and uh, the second one uh, is solved in terms of system problem by two types of moves. One is so-called reverse move and one is transpose move. So uh, as you see, these are relatively complicated moves which are uh, going to be implemented. Uh, so the reverse move is the one where we select at random uh, a path between two cities. Uh, both are selected at random, and zero and one. And then we just reverse this path. So instead of going forward uh, or the path, we decided to go backward toward this path. So this path is then being visited in, in, a, in opposite direction, as you can see. So it goes in this direction. <laughs> and all other cities are the same. So that's so-called reverse because it reverses a segment to go in the opposite direction. And the other one is called transpose, which is slightly more complicated. So basically we also uh, reverse the direction in which we go through cities. So as you can see, instead of going forward, we are gonna go, well, actually, no, we still go forward, but we, we actually insert them somewhere else into another, uh, another place. Uh, which is randomly selected on the remaining of the path. Uh, now, how hard is this to implement? Well, not that hard. Um, so here is the code. Um, you can download it either, either from, from GitHub or from the uh, local website. Uh, website is here. Uh, so for example, traveling salesman problem. This should give you uh, the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, now, um, what do we do here? Uh, we are using Numba to speed up uh, most of steps because uh, uh, this minimization tend to be uh, somewhat slow for Python implementation. So we're gonna use a uh, hundred, uh, just a second, the total, total number of cities is just hundred. Yes, I think hundred cities for this example. Of course, we can increase this number if need be. Uh, and uh, we are gonna uh, here uh, select the, uh, the coordinates in two dimensions. So we kind of imagine to have a two dimensional space. Uh, so there are gonna be N cities, two dimensional coordinates, isn't that? There's a vector of uh, a vector coordinates for each city. And uh, this uh, so R is the position of n cities, and then city uh, is the index with which we are gonna visit the cities. So, for example, we start always with a simple um, uh, uh, simple per permutation, which is uh, the identity. So uh, zero, one, two, three, four to n minus one, does not. So the range operator or range function gives uh, the gives the integers zero, one, two, three, n. So we are, we, are, we are visiting cities in their order in which they appear in this uh, in this r um, uh, random uh, random positions. Um, then uh, we have these two routines. One is the distance, which measures the distance between two cities, so R1 and R2. These are two-dimensional vectors, of course. R1 is two-dimensional vector, R2 is two-dimensional vector, and to distance between them is just simply uh, square root of uh, x, x squared plus y squared, isn't that? But this 
can be calculated with using uh, with using NumPy linear algebra uh, norm. Uh, so this is the difficult uh, uh, distance from two points in space. So x plus y square square. So then um, the total distance between uh, all the cities. So when the traveling salesman goes through all possible cities is very simple. It's just you go over all cities and you always look at the distance between city i and city i plus one, is that? Of course, in order to, to do this properly, I has to start at zero and has to, has to stop at, uh, at n minus two, therefore land on city minus, so range of land on city minus one. So we start at n minus two, but then we need to add the last piece, which is from n minus one back to zero. So basically the entire, the entire curve is now um, uh, completed in the sense that uh, um, that uh, that we start with uh, city zero and we end at city zero. Uh, yeah, so basically total distance that measures the entire distance uh, of the, the journey. Um, then we uh, also produce uh, a function plot, which basically just plots uh, in, in two dimensions, uh, the current journey. So how do we do that? Well, that's pretty simple. So we have index city, which is the index in which the cities are visited. R is the, uh, is the uh, contains the vectors of all the cities. Um, and of course, R is fixed through, the, uh, through this optimization. The only things that we're changing is this index array city. That's basically just integers. We are, we are changing. Uh, the the uh, we are changing the indexes in, uh, in the order in which the cities are being visited, and then uh, this this is actually current distance that we that we uh, and, uh, that of the total path is that current distance current distance of the total path of the journey. So um, then, uh, how do we plot this? Well, we just take the coordinates. Uh, in the right order, so R of city of I, uh, and I goes over all cities, or 100 in, in this case. So this gives you the coordinates uh, in the correct order in which the uh, traveling salesman is visiting them, isn't that? So we get, we get X, Y in correct order. So X, I, uh, well, X, zero, uh, well, X, I, Y, I, uh, in the correct order, isn't that? So in correct order, we get we get that. Uh, and uh, so this is PT. It's a, it's a list currently uh, of uh, of uh, X Y pairs in correct order in the order in which being, they are being visited. Uh, so we add here uh, the last uh, piece of the journey. So basically, when the uh, uh, when the traveling salesman. Uh, visits the last city needs to come back to the first city of origin and uh, then we we change this list into an array uh, because we want to take slices uh, when we plot we take the slices which is the zero is the x coordinate and one is the y coordinate and then we plot with uh, this o minus which means we plot with the dot every time and the line between the coordinates so uh, this displays a curve a curve like that so uh, which on the top it says well the title is total distance and with a number what current distance is and uh, the the uh, this pt now, now contains x coordinates and y coordinates which are just pl pl plotted as, as every every plot is uh, usually plotted okay so now in order to plot this we, we import from uh, from pile up the usual matplotlib inline and then we plot, we plot, we core plot by current uh, index city, which is just a, a, a range, isn't it? From zero to n minus one, which means that we are visiting cities in uh, 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 in uh, original order. R is the random position of cities, and total distance is in this case uh, is this case uh, something of the order of twenty. Or 50. So of course, if we uh, reevaluate this thing, we're going to get slightly different uh, distance and slightly different uh, uh, plot uh, because we are um, 
uh, we are not reinitializing random number to the same uh, to the same random number, but some other um, some other random numbers uh, uh, are are being used. So uh, now it's time to implement the two moves. Okay, so up to now we just set up the problem. Um, and now we need to implement the moves and then finally the uh, minimization process. So the moves, however, need to be a little bit um, optimized with Numba, uh, this JIT here, um, because uh, they are going to be used uh, many, many times. Um, and uh, well, first we're going to uh, we're going to find uh, a segment of four cities, N0, N1, N2, N3. So now what, what is the segment? Well, this is actually just very simple from this plot. We you, In both moves, we need a segment where we, where we have N0, N1, N2, N3 cities. So we need these, these four cities, isn't that? So this segment of cities. So how do we find these four cities, N0, N1, N2, N3? Well, that's explained here. Um, well, maybe we should, uh, we should have this plot uh, at the same time as we uh, discuss the, the algorithm. So um, number of cities is, is clearly just the length of the entire array. Uh, and then uh, what do we do? Uh, well, we need to uh, have an infinite loop here. Um, which can, which is broken, uh, which we break out or which we jump out once we have, once we find legitimate, uh, legitimate set of cities. Okay, um, but if we didn't, if this, if we didn't succeed yet in finding legitimate uh, set of cities, we need to disregard this, uh, uh, these points and zero and one and two that we, which we managed to, to get up to now, and we need to start from from scratch. We need to find some other set of legitimate cities. Now, what are legitimate cities? Well, what can happen is that N0 and N1 are so close by that we cannot find N2 and N3, uh, which are where N2 is, be, is the city be, be, before N0 and N3 is the city after N1. So we need to be able to, uh, sell, to find N2 and N3, which are not the same. So N2 and N3 are not allowed to be the same. So how do we do that? Well, first uh, N0 is completely random and it can be any number, any city uh, in, in this array of cities because N city is number of cities. Rand will give you a random number between zero and one. And if we take the integer of that, we get any integer between zero and number of cities minus one. So now N1 has to be a city, any city, but uh, the current N0. Now, of course, we could we could use here uh, again NCT times RAND, but then we would need to say if N0 is equal to N1, then disregard this, and uh, we don't have a good a good um, a good example yet. But maybe this is more efficient because we know that when we select uh, N1 in the rest of the series that these are only n minus one options, isn't that? So therefore we, we use here n number of city minus one times random. So this will give you integer number between zero and n minus two rather than zero and n minus one. So it's gonna be zero and n minus two. But then we know that if uh, n one is, uh, is, is uh, less than n zero, then n zero and n one are already good and are already, are already uh, good, good to cities. However, if N1 is bigger than N0, then we increase N1 for one. Why? Because here, uh, of course, uh, we need to, the point is that we need to skip N0. So if, if, the, if N1, which we were, we were selecting, uh, comes before N0, then N1 is fine. If N1 is after N0, we need to skip N0, and, uh, and that, which means that N1 has to be increased by one. Now, however, uh, in this algorithm, we expect N1 to be the biggest number and N0 the smallest number, because in this plot, we decided that uh, kind of the, the direction of the journey is from N0 to N1. That's our choice. So therefore, we always wanted to make N1 to be larger number than N0. So therefore, here we have an in if sentence, if N1, however, is less than N0, then just turn them around. Okay, so just for convenience. We wanted to have 
that, that N1 is bigger than N0. Okay, so after this step, uh, we always get uh, legitimate N1 and legitimate N0 in such a way that N1 is always bigger than N0. So this up to here, we always succeed to find two cities like that. That's trivial. However, the question then is whether the rest of the cities outside that segment between N0 and N1 uh, is sufficiently large, okay? Sufficiently large means it needs to be at least uh, of size three, okay? Why? Because, well, we need to have N2 and N3, which are different, and then having a finite segment between N2 and N3, which means there has to be at least one city uh, in between. So, um, yeah, so the rest of the cities has to be bigger than equal three. If this is not the case, that means that uh, that uh, basically the, the segment that we are trying to uh, select is almost the entire, the entire uh, uh, array of cities, in which case the, the move would be completely trivial I and mean, we don't attempt it. So, however, if this, end, this remain, the remainder is big enough, then we know that we can always find the city before the first city and we can find the city after the second city and the two are not the same. So N2 and N3 are not the same, doesn't it? Because this N, N uh, the, the rest of this, the second, the, the size of this, the rest of the cities was bigger than three. So this is, this, this is guaranteed then that N2 and N3 exist. Uh, of course, we take here modulus because, um, if, uh, because we might jump around. So we have, of course, um, uh, con uh, boundary conditions are such that it doesn't matter uh, uh, where we start. Uh, so uh, the, the curve is connected to itself. So it means that the, the city of n plus one is the same as city uh, of, n of one. Um, yeah, so uh, now we have uh, n0, n1, n2, n3. Uh, selected in exactly the same way as here in the plot. So uh, N0, N1, N2, N3, which are, which are returned. So basically this find the segment, finds this segment that is dark blue here and the two red, red dots. And then we can ask uh, how expensive it is to, uh, to reverse the, to, to take this, the first move, to reverse the, the order. Okay, so what is the cost? Well, that's, uh, that's quite easy. We just look at this plot here and we, we, we immediately identify the cost. Uh, we, need to, we need to add, well, the, the positive contribution to the cost is the new connection, which is between city of N2 and city of N1. So city of N2 and, and uh, just a second, of N2, of, of N2 and N1, yes, yeah. so N2 and N1, so we have this connection here between N2 and N1, and then we have also the connection between N0 and N3, which is this connection between N0 and N3. So these are the two, the two new connections. However, we need to remove the two old connections, which is the one between N2 and N0, so it's this one, which we remove, and then we also remove the one between N1 and N3, doesn't it? these two. So we, we remove two and we connect two. And uh, well, uh, this is the this is the cost of this first move. And now, once we see that this cost of the first move should be accepted in simulation, then we need to actually reverse the the order. So then we actually change the array uh, city. Okay. So how do we change the array of city? Well, it's also not hard. Um, the way we do it here is that we first copy the array, so, so city is an array, and we copy it into another array, new city, so that we somehow don't, uh, don't uh, uh, overwrite. Um, uh, this is, this is uh, yeah, we, we are basically change, we don't wanna change it in place because this is more, more complicated. Changing it in place would need slightly more complicated code and for simplicity, I didn't wanna do that. So we copied first the city into new city. And then uh, this part is actually very easy. So uh, we just, uh, up to N0, nothing needs to be changed, okay? But from N0, 
so and the, the city N0, N0 plus one, N0 plus two, and so on needs to be changed. And we know that needs to be changed between, uh, uh, be, so between N1 and N0. So basically the number of cities that needs to be changed uh, is the length of this new segment, N1 minus N0 plus one, isn't it? So these are the cities that we need to change. And the first one that we change is N0, and then N0 plus one, N0 plus two, and so on. And finally, the one, the last one that we change is N, N1. Uh, and so which cities do we put in? Well, we just turn around the segment, which means that we have N1 minus J. So that will, uh, that, that will ensure that we are going in the segment from N1 to N0 in reverse order, isn't that? So, uh, in, so we assign to N0, N1, and then we assign into N0 plus one, N1 minus one, and so on and so forth. And finally, we assign into N1, N0. So that's exactly equivalent to saying that we reverse this segment, doesn't it? Okay, so once, uh, once we have this, uh, all the cities uh, 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 reversed in the segment, so then we can uh, return this uh, new array. So this is, the, this is all that we need for, um, for the, step, the step one, which is uh, reverse. And then uh, we still need to work out the transpose move. So how is this transpose move different from reverse? Well, we have the plot here, which is slightly more complicated. So in addition to N0, N1, N2, and N3, we also need N4 and N5. So how do we do that? Well, uh, first we're gonna repeat uh, finding the segment uh, like before, we need N0, N1, N2, N3. So we, we, so we find them in exactly the same way. Then uh, we checked uh, how big is the how big is the remainder of the cities? So whatever is not in the segment, um, and uh, then we know that in the remain the remainment of the cities, we need to find n four and n five. Uh, actually, it's a little bit more complicated. We need to look at it in the remainder of the cities minus one. Uh, because I guess we don't want N2 and N3 to be, we don't N4 to be equal to N2 or N3. They shouldn't be. So here we are selecting a number which is between, uh, between zero and the rest of the cities minus two, isn't it? So because here we have N and minus one. So the rest of the cities minus two can be either zero or between zero and the rest of the cities minus two, and then uh, we add to this N1 plus one, which means that N4 is something that comes after, uh, after uh, N3, because N1 plus one is actually N3. But we then, of course, uh, do modulus and number of cities, because if the, if, we, if, the, if the index is bigger than the length of the cities, then of course we need to periodically continue back to, um, uh, to the beginning. Uh, because the curve is connected to itself. Okay, so N5 then, of course, is just uh, the city which follows N4, uh, like, like in this plot. So N5 is the city that follows N4. Uh, and of course, we shouldn't forget this modulus because we jump, we can, we can, uh, the, the curve is connected to itself. So once we have N4 and N5, we of course need to return the entire set of, uh, set, set of uh, cities and zero and one and two and three and four and five. And uh, then we still need to uh, calculate the cost of this transpose and how to actually transpose the, array, the, the, uh, the order. So the cost of transpose, I mean, we just look at the plot and we can immediately see what needs to happen. So we need to subtract the, land, the, the, the distance between N1 and N3. So we, we remove this part, this piece. Then we remove the distance between N0 and N2, which is this, this little uh, part, okay? Then we also remove the distance between N4 and N5. So it's this path, of course, but we add then. So what do we add? Well, we add the distance between N0 and N4, which is from here to here. Then we add the distance from N1 to N5, okay, N1 to N5, 
which is from here to here, clearly, that's what we need to do. And then we add also the distance between N2 and N3, N2 and N3, okay? So just like what the, this plot shows, we are adding, we are adding all, we are adding, subtracting this pieces, uh, like, like showing this picture. Okay, so the cost transpose is then pretty simple. So as you see, we never really, um, except at the beginning, we don't compute the entire uh, length of the journey, we just update it. We just update and just recompute the pieces of the journey which are, uh, which are being changed. And then uh, once uh, this um, uh, transpose step is accepted, we actually need to transpose the cities. We need to visit them now in the new uh, in the new order. Now this is a little bit more complicated. It is entirely possible to um, just um, uh, to just uh, uh, update the array of cities um, uh, in line in the sense that um, uh, in place. So we can do it in place if we if we need and, and numerical recipes. Uh, actually um, implemented it in such a way that they uh, uh, update the order uh, in place. They don't allocate a new array. Now, on the other hand, um, my uh, feeling is that this code, uh, which changes the cities in place, is very, very messy and uh, maybe not worth uh, uh, um, coding it. I mean, this we, we don't do this so often so we can afford here i mean at least the way i implement it is we can afford uh creating a new a new array um and um uh and uh then then the the code is much simpler so what i do here is i just i, I create new um list i mean the uh, changing the list into array uh, would probably be slightly more efficient and it's probably useful, but I haven't done, I didn't do it. Uh, so the way I do it here is I, I create a list and then at the end of the day, list is, uh, is being uh, changed into array when we return. Um, so writing directly into, uh, into array will be slightly more efficient, but slightly less uh, transparent. Um, uh, the, of course, the most the, the most efficient and the least transparent is the one where we, where we change things in place. But so what do we do? Uh, th this, I think, is the, the simplest. This new city at the beginning is the new list, Python list, which, which will contain eventually all the cities. So now we just start throwing into this empty array the new cities in the order in which we see on the plot, we visit them. So I started here by adding first the segment between N0 to N1. So I decided to first just add on the list, the cities from zero from N0 to N1. Okay, so this and new city, as you can see, it's quite kind of obvious. He just first throws on the new uh, uh, list, the, the segment from N0 to N1. And then from this, we it follows the segment from N5 to N2. Okay, so okay, this code clearly just uh, uh, just uh, takes the cities from N5 when J is equal to zero, we have N5, and then when J is equal to N2 minus N5, then uh, this is equal to uh, 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 N2. So basically, this. A little code just uh, uh, throws onto new city the previous cities, uh, the, the previous cities in the uh, range between N5 and N2. And then, uh, then finally, this little code throws onto this, this array the cities between N3 and N4. N3 and N4, isn't it? And uh, this is it. So N4 is the last city. And then this has to be followed by N0, but, but since we are using periodic boundary condition, that is done automatically. So uh, then this, this little code uh, now uh, just um, uh, throws into the list the cities in the correct new order for that correspond to the transpose move. 
Again, this is maybe not the most efficient way, or it's definitely not the most efficient way to do the transpose, but nevertheless, is probably the simplest to read. So therefore, that's how I implemented it. Um, yeah, so let me evaluate all this now. So we will here 15. So let me evaluate all the moves that I just described you. Um, and now here, we are just trying one move. So uh, find T segment, for example, let's, uh, let's try transpose move. Then we evaluate cost of that particular transpose. So um, for, for cost transpose move, we need, first we need the, uh, the, the, uh, um, the positions of all the cities, which is contained in R. Then we need, we need the uh, array of uh, index array of how we visit the cities, which is called city. And then finally we need N0, N1, N2, N3, N4, N5. Uh, and so how do we get and zero and one and two and three and four and five from the tuple of those same numbers. So find T segment, as you uh, remember, uh, gives you uh, this array and zero and one and two and three and four and five. And so now somehow when we coded cost transpose, we did not decide to use uh, uh, NN as being an, an array between N0 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, but we actually want explicitly uh, in this uh, as an argument of five or six integers. Okay, so that's what we required. Somehow that's how we code it. And therefore we need to use so called unpacking. So when you have the star in front of NN, means we are taking a tuple of certain numbers, in this case, six numbers, we're taking a tuple of six numbers. And we create from this tuple of six numbers, six arguments, isn't that six arguments, which are in this case, and zero and one and two and three and four and five. Okay, so it's so called unpacking the arguments. And in some sense, it's, it's it comes handy. So of course, the alternative would be that you would write here n n. Uh, so alternative would be would be to write here n n of zero, n n of one, uh, n n of two. Uh, oops. And n of three, and n of four, and actually and n of five. Uh, yeah, n of five. Okay. So instead of instead of uh, uh, this one little dot, we would need to write all this uh, code. Doesn't it? So it's kind of more much more clumsy. And that, so this unpacking actually comes handy here. Okay. So um, we then. Uh, tried our, uh, our transpose and how much it costs. Uh, and then we print here the cost. Uh, we actually transpose and we print the new order of cities. Okay, so let's see. Uh, for this particular case, transpose actually cost us something. It's not free, cost us something. And uh, the new uh, order of cities is clearly not, it doesn't start with zero, one but it starts with 13, 14, 15, 16, and so on. So clearly the transpose has been done. Okay, so uh, now we have both, um, uh, both uh, uh, steps, uh, transpose and uh, reverse uh, implemented. Uh, I mean, the steps are implemented. Now we need to uh, write the uh, actual uh, uh, simulated annealing. Um, or the actual uh, um, uh, simulation. Uh, now here, here is the code. It's actually extremely, extremely short um, simulated annealing. So this is all there is to it. There is to it for simulated annealing. So the input here is uh, the index array CT, which contains the order in which the cities are visited. Uh, and of course, this is the only thing that we are changing. CT is the uh, array, uh, index array, which is being optimized. Then R is a fixed uh, list of, or array of um, uh, two-dimensional vectors uh, for the cities. Uh, max steps is the number of uh, steps, I think, yeah, for I in max steps. So it's a number of steps at constant temperature 
that we will try. Okay, so there, are, there is maximum amount of steps, which we always try uh, at finite, at uh, each temperature to equilibrate uh, the, uh, the, the system at this temperature. Then uh, we need to have certain number of accepted steps every time in order that we change the temperature. So uh, if the number of accepted steps is bigger than this max accepted, then we are gonna, we are gonna uh, uh, change the temperature. We are free to change the temperature now. So T start is the starting temperature um, or the high temperature, which is bigger than typical change in the function. Then F cool is a, is a value with which we uh, cool down. So we said that we are gonna typically take uh, temperature to be 10% smaller, which, F, which corresponds F cool is 0.9, a factor with which we multiply the previous temperature to get new temperature. And then max T steps is the number of uh, steps uh, uh, that for, of the cooling process. So how many times we're gonna, we're gonna reduce the temperature or anneal. And then uh, finally, P reverse is the probability with which we are going to uh, select each of the two steps. So P, re P reverse means how often do we uh, do we attempt reverse move, uh, and how often do we uh, attempt transpose move? Here we're going to take P reverse is 0.5, which means that the, both moves are going to be attempted with the same probability. So now, before I go through this code, I could I want to show you. Uh, what these parameters uh, are. So n city is going to be 100, which means we're going to have 100 cities uh, when we run. Then maximum number of steps is 100 times n cities. So 100 times 100, isn't it? Which is 10,000. So we're going to we're going to attempt 10,000 steps at each constant uh, constant temperature to equilibrate. And then, however, if we manage to make 10 times number of cities, which means 10,000, if we manage to make 1,000 uh, steps uh, at constant temperature, then we, are, we, are, uh, we believe that, it's, that we are ready to, uh, to change the temperature. Now, of course, if you want to have um, slower, um, uh, slower um, annealing, or basically more precise annealing, I mean, annealing which will guarantee you a better approach to or, or more safe approach to global minimum, you would need to uh, ask for much more, uh, much bigger number of steps and much larger uh, number of accept, accepted steps. So you we could ask that you have to have uh, 100 times NCT accepted steps and 1000 times um, NCT uh, steps attempted. Uh, now T start is a is is a, a starting temperature which is uh, which is relatively high so 0.2 so the, the, when the distance uh, the this well the cost uh, the, the change of this function is clearly much bigger than 0.2 so 0.2 is high temperature in this case uh, F cool is going to be 0.9 which means the temperature will get reduced by multiplying previous temperature by 0.9. And then maximum number of cooling down steps is going to be 100. But probably we'll break, we'll break out of the loop before we reach that. OK, so now you know roughly the, these parameters that are reasonable for this problem. And then the algorithm is here. It's actually very, very simple. So we start our temperature is starting temperature. And our distance can be computed by the bow routine that we just described. Uh, how to how to calculate the total the total distance of the loop or the traveling salesman? So this has been implemented. This total distance has been implemented implemented here. We discussed it a few minutes a uh, few minutes ago. Okay, so that's all we need at the beginning. So then, what do we do? Well, we go over all steps, uh, all temperature steps. So all annealing steps, all the temperatures at which we are which we, uh, which we uh, change the temperature. So this is one temperature step. What do we do at each temperature step? Uh, so th the number of these steps cannot be bigger than max these steps, which in this case, we selected 100. Uh, but of course, we are gonna break out of this loop if uh, the last, in the last step, there was no accepted step. 
Okay, in the last temperature, there was no exciting step. So this will, uh, at least in this particular problem, we will always break out of here. So it's irrelevant how big max t steps is. You could make make it much bigger, and you wouldn't change the wouldn't change the 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 the, um, the, the result. So uh, basically, uh, in less than hundred steps, we are gonna uh, reach the stage at which. Uh, at one low temperature, at, at particular low temperature, we will no step will succeed for uh, 100 NCT attempted steps. So we're going to try 100 NCT, except we're going to try to uh, reverse or transpose a move uh, 10,000 times, and none of these steps will succeed. And if that's the case, then we say, well, we found a reasonable global minimum. And then we then this if accepted is zero breaks we break out of the loop and that's it we're finished. Again, this doesn't guarantee you exactly global minima. It might be that uh, some better solution is possible. And if you want to be more precise, we would need to um, uh, to just attempt more steps. For example, we would need to allow more steps. Okay, so uh, what do we do at each finite uh, at, at each constant temperature? So first we say, well, right now we have no accepted steps yet. So let's see how many accepted steps can we, can we make? So we have a loop here over all possible steps uh, at constant temperature. So we go for I in range max steps. So which is basically 100 times NCT steps, 10,000 in this case. So we try, we attempt here 10,000 uh, 10, steps. And we say that 50% uh, of the time we try reverse and 50% of the time we try transpose. So if P reverse is bigger than a random number between uh, zero and one, then we are gonna try reverse move. Uh, however, if in, in, in the other 50% of the time, we're gonna try transpose move. So uh, let's say that, uh, that uh, we are in this 50% of the time when the reverse move is uh, attempted. So then we know what to do. Well, we first find uh, a segment that, that is sufficient for this reverse move, which is N0, N1, N2, N3, I think, or we need only N0, N1, N2, N3. Yes. So these uh, four cities, so NN will contain these four cities. Then we calculate how much it would cost to reverse, which is just cost reverse. So we are not actually doing the reverse move yet. We just calculate if this is, if this is something that would uh, uh, should be accepted. And then we use usual metropolis. So metropolis says that uh, we should, uh, we should uh, calculate exponent of minus exponent of the cost divided by temperature, isn't it? And then we accept with the probability proportional to this Boltzmann type, uh, type distribution. So, uh, now uh, I want to I want to remind you that this is what we decided uh, at the very beginning. So we said that we are going to have a metropolis type uh, probability density, which is going to be e to the minus value of the function divided by t. And that's exactly what we are doing here. So we are saying that if this dE is negative, negative means that this exponent is God definitely going to be bigger than one. In this case, we definitely accept. So if the E is negative, we definitely need to accept. However, if DV is positive, we might still accept, but of course, depending, depending on the temperature. So, um, so if, um, this, uh, if the E to the minus F over T, which is this E to the minus D over T is, um, if this is uh, bigger than some random number between zero and one, then we still accept. Okay, so we, we, we then increase the number of accepted step by one. Uh, we uh, update the distance. Um, so we don't need to recompute the distance. We just update it by the calculated the cost. And then we, this is of course the most expensive, expensive step. Here, we actually reverse the uh, index array for the cities. So we, we, uh, uh, we change the index array in which the cities are visited. Okay, so uh, this was all for reverse move. Now, um, 
we need to do the same thing for uh, uh, for transpose move. So exactly the same thing. So we find uh, we find uh, the segments, which means that we need to uh, figure out what uh, what are n zero, n one, n two, n three, n four, n five. In this case, we need five five those numbers. We remember all these five n's. Uh, then uh, we calculate the cost for that transpose here, and then again we do the same metropolis step. So if this cost is uh, yeah, is sufficiently uh, sufficiently small, then we accept this. We update the distance. We change this the array in which the cities are now visited. Um, so this all this is basically very simple metropolis uh, metropolis uh, step. Now uh, here, this of course this sentence is different than typically in metropolis. So what we do here is if the number of accepted step is bigger then this max accepted, which we said here is like 10 times n city. So if we accept a sufficient number of steps, then we can say, well, okay, we can now go back. We can now go and change the temperature. Uh, uh, we can now go and change and reduce the temperature. Uh, and um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, equilibrate at a lower temperature because uh, once we have so many steps accepted, we can say that the system is more or less equilibrated to, the, to this temperature. So now if we um, come to here, which means that either we have enough uh, accepted steps, more than max accepted, or uh, we went through uh, all possible um, uh, steps at this annealing temperature, uh, which is 100 times number of cities, then we, we are free now to reduce the temperature um, by multiplying the temp current temperature by F cool, which is 0.9. And then uh, every time we are going to change the temperature, we are also going to plot the current uh, path, uh, that, and we are going to display the total distance. Uh, we are also going to print the current distance and how many steps were accepted in this uh, iteration, and so on. And then finally, once we uh, once uh, we go through uh, hundred times n CD steps, and none of them succeeds at particular temperature. Then we can say the temperature is low enough that doesn't need to be uh, that, that uh, it's unlikely that we're gonna gonna be able to find better minimum than current minimum. So um, at that time we break out of the loop and that's it. And then we once more plot the final distribution of cities, which means the final path. Okay, so this is the, the algorithm, and now. Uh, yeah, I think I explained all this, so we can start running it, and you see. So the, the, this the, uh, the the after the first uh, the, at the first temperature, we managed to reduce the distance from fifty. I think we started with the distance fifty something. Yeah, fifty four point five fifty two, and the uh, so this this curve looks or this uh, path looks very very. Uh, uh, busy, um, uh, lots of crossings. So even at the highest possible temperature, we reduce from 50 to 30.9. This is temperature 0.2, of course. And we had uh, one, so how much? Thousand accepted steps, okay? Thousand accepted steps. And then once we have so many accepted steps, we said, well, okay, now it's, it's time to reduce the temperature because so many steps can be accepted this temperature. It means that we're still far about the, the critical point where uh, we might get stuck into a local minima. So um, we reduce temperature to 0.18 from 0.2, which is multiplying by 0.9. And then in the next iteration, the distance became 28. Uh, and looks like a yeah, slightly less crossing curve. So then we reduce the temperature down, down to 0.162. We the distance got reduced to 28, and we still get 1,000 accepted steps. And again, one. So all these uh, high temperatures, we clearly get. We stop when we have when we have number of accepted steps to be equal to max accepted. Okay, clearly max accepted is a 10 times n city, which is 1,000. So we always st stop here when we have 1,000 n one accepted step. Uh, and yeah, so we reduce, reduce, reduce. So clearly here the annealing is pretty efficient. Ah, and here we start to see 
that uh, the number of steps was not anymore thousand. So at this temperature of 1.0956, we, uh, we didn't accept as many steps as uh, the maximum number. And so now the, we start to see uh, we start to see that the, the, that um, that uh, uh, the random walker is sometimes stuck a little bit into into uh, local minima. Um, yeah, at this time the distance was 19.2. Uh, and then, of course, when we reduce the temperature further, we see that uh, at lower temperature it's even harder to uh, to accept so many so many moves. So less and less of the attempt and steps are being accepted, 612, but the distance, of course, are being reduced, so still less, less and less accepted steps. And then finally, we still have the order of 100 accepted steps, then 58 accepted steps, but by this time, uh, when the temperature becomes 0 0.02, we see that the, the curve is now, is now uh, much uh, less crossing. There's still a little crossing here and there, but uh, relatively few. And then, uh, yeah, the, the, the distance gets reduced even further to 0 .7, 8.7 and so on. And eventually, uh, there are less and less accepted steps. Here we have only 23, 22, 9, 3, 5, 4 accepted steps, 7 accepted steps, 3. And finally, so at this, at this point, you still have, we had three accepted steps with distance 0 0.2, but then uh, at the very last time, the distance became 0 0.24 and accepted no accepted steps anymore. So basically, the curve did not change, even though we, ex we, we attempted 10,000 uh, 10, moves. Now, of course, this does not guarantee that this was exact global minimum, although it looks pretty decent. Um, if we want to have a better minimum, we, we would need to do several things. For example, we could... Um, we could increase uh, maximum number of accepted steps. We could increase maximum steps. Of course, both can be, let's say, increased to a factor of 10. And then we could uh, reduce F cool. We could increase F cool to 0 0.99. Let's say that we are going to, we are going to changing the schooling much, much slower. And then um, this would uh, uh, bring us closer to the, well, it will, it will be more, we could be more sure that the, uh, minimum that we're obtaining is the is the global minimum not rather than local minimum okay so this is it um we uh, i went through the entire uh, traveling salesman problem and uh, uh, the floor is open for questions so uh is there any question that you might have on this algorithm Did you understand the algorithm? Is it clear? Professor, I'm curious about the temperature parameter. Yes, you're curious about the temperature. What temperature? Well, the temperature variable. Um, yes. Is it like analogous to the hotter the system, the more, uh, like the more energy back and forth, the more random jumps we have between cities here without uh, very, you know, a lot of distance. I'm just trying to make sense of it. I don't really. I mean, the temperature here is, of, of course, a completely artificial thing. So um, uh, we are trying to simulate a generic function f in terms of some physical system, isn't it? At the very beginning, we introduced this this uh, exponent. So we, we said that uh, we we're going to accept with uh, we're going to have probability density, which is uh, Boltzmann with this e to the minus fx over t. Uh, and um, of course, this function uh, could have a typical value uh, either one or 10,000 or million. And so the temperature would need to uh, take this into account. So if the function, for example, worries a lot. Okay, so the function worries a lot. And in this typical distance here, is let's say 100 then temperature should be of the order of 100 okay and if the function is of course uh, looks like that and this typical distance is of the order of one then temperature should be of the order of one now of course we don't necessarily know um, uh, by if somebody gives you a, a routine that can calculate function we don't necessarily know what the typical 
uh, variation of the function is. So it needs to be of the order of the variation of the function or basically bigger than that. So because if there is just one global minimum, then we don't care what temperature is, of course, we're always going to get it. But if you have several minima, and then the barrier between these minima is, uh, is uh, has to be uh, smaller than our temperature. So in other words, this temperature has to be something that is bigger than the barrier between minima so that we can tunnel from uh, from uh, one minimum to another, isn't it? Because the, the idea of this Boltzmann is nothing but tunneling. We need to go from one to another or basically jumping from minimum. It's not quantum mechanics, it's classical mechanics. So you're basically just uh, trying to, to go from uh, global from local minima to global minima. But in order to do that, we need to have um, you need to have temperature sufficiently high. And of course, the idea is that um, the idea is that uh, this will allow you to eventually get stuck into global minima because if one minima is much smaller than the rest, Boltzmann will guarantee you that you that you you're, you will go from time to time into that minimum and we're going to go from time to time into that minimum but nevertheless you're going to spend most of the time in that minimum because if the minimum is is uh, deeper if one minimum is deeper than the rest then uh, Boltzmann will guarantee you to spend more time in the global in the in the global minimum than the rest of the minimums okay and so the idea is that once you reduce the temperature just a little bit, you're going to stay even more in this global minimum, and uh, and eventually you're going to you're going to get stuck there. Now, of course, the the, the sometimes um, uh, you might be unlucky, and somehow even though you're spending much less time in a local minima, you might still get stuck there. It's possible, okay, if the change of the temperature is uh, is somewhat uh, fast. But of course, if the temperature is, is changing extremely small, slowly, adiabatically, then the fact that you're using that you're spending much more time in the global minima should help you to to, to get stuck in there. But if your temperature is too low to start and you end up getting stuck in a local minima, yeah. then you ever getting out. Absolutely. That's a problem. So the, the one of the requirements of using the algorithm is that you that you choose high enough temperature as a temperature which is high enough but i mean in at least in this algorithm that we that we saw here that is kind of obvious what temperature should be to start with i mean if you if the temperature is low enough you're not going to accept anything oh, well, you're not going to accept more, a lot of moves isn't it so if if it turns out that you are not accepting a lot of moves you're accepting very very small percentage of moves then your temperature is too low, isn't it? So I would say you have to start with a temperature in which you accept, I don't know, at least 50% of the moves, isn't it? And that's just a trial and error thing at that point? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the point is you need to, you need to start with a, with a temperature at which uh, you can efficiently move in the phase space. Again, if the function is terribly complicated, you might still be a problem. Let's say that the function is such that you, you have one huge barrier. Uh, let's say that you have you have a function which, which has a reasonable minimum here, then there is a huge barrier, and then another set, okay? So in this case, of course, you might be stuck on the left-hand side all the time, or you might be stuck on the right-hand side, and because there is a huge barrier in between, uh, you, uh, your temperature might never be sufficiently high to be able to jump across, okay? So you might see, uh, aha, sorry, you didn't, you didn't see my plotting. So that's what I want to show you. So let's say you have this situation. Let's say that you have, um, you have a left-hand side where the, when the function looks like uh, it has several minimum, but one is global, one, one looks like a global minimum. And then you have the right hand side where you have another set of minima and a global minimum. And now the temperature has to be sufficiently high that you can go across this large barrier from the left to right. Okay. So of course, if, the, if you start with a temperature somewhere here, there is no hope to, to jump across. Uh, but if you start with a temperature which is sufficiently high, bigger than this, then you have some chance to get 
into the slope global minima. Although the truth is that since these two minima are quite close to each other, you will probably spend around 50% of the time on the left and 50% on the right hand side, isn't it? So uh, this is a relatively complicated problem for simulated leading. And I think it's maybe just a little bit more than 50% chance that you're going to get into this minima rather than that one, because they're kind of similar depth, the two are similar depth. Okay, yeah, so I mean, the method is not perfect, of course, but, uh, but it's still probably one of the best methods to find the global minimum of the function. Any other question? No question? No question for me? I have a question. Okay. Yeah, so here your temperature is uh, cooled by uh, like by pro like mm -hmm. proportionally, right? So how about the if your cooling rate is a constant? In other words, if you cool the system down like in a constant rate linearly. Like, uh, you mean that you would uh, reduce it what uh, from let's say uh, uh in linear ways so from 0 0.2 0 0.1 0. Uh, yeah linearly would this be better so now we are doing of course exponentially isn't it because we're yeah. multiplying with the factor so in other words you feel like your cooling rate is very high initially right it's and then it's very low so you know, initially it's very low yeah so that somehow this initially works very well but then uh, eventually it becomes very fast, doesn't it? Because it's exponential. It's 0.9. Oh. Yeah, to be honest, I don't know. I mean, of course, the simplest way to make it better is to just change this factor to 0.99. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, but uh, would be would be better to kind of do it linear in the sense that you subtract from temperature something rather than multiply? I don't know. I haven't. I haven't tried that. It's a good. It's a good suggestion. I have no idea whether this would be better or worse. Yeah, because the, the, the reason why I ask is uh, when you run molecular dynamic simulation, you will need to give a cooling rate first, and then let the system yeah. cool down. Sorry, sorry. You need to give what? A cooling rate first. Like there are three parameters. One, one is the initial temperature. One is final temperature. And the third mm -hmm. one is how many steps you want to spend. Yes. Yes. So, so in most cases, I mean, but, but that, that's molecular dynamics. Of course, it's a, well, it's it's a, it's a different story. But in, I think in most cases, the cooling rate, the, the rate itself is a, a constant. Like, I see. I mean, you know, yeah, in uh, reality. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good question. In this algorithm, I think most people use this uh, uh, multiplicative factor. But I mean, I I don't know if this is really the most efficient. I mean, I, I, I yeah. 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 Yeah, maybe we can have a try because it's just a, a few modification, few modification of lines. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a okay. small, small, small change of, of code. Maybe it's more efficient. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Thank you. Any other question? Um, so today is the last time. But I'm I'm not gonna let you give let let you go. Uh, too quickly. So <laughs> I decided to show you one more thing. So mo mostly for fun. It's not going to be a homework. Ah, you still have one homework to do. And some of you sent me the, the final homework, but those of you who didn't, please uh, send me the solution to the homework so that I can give you the grade. Uh, yeah, okay. But before that, is there any question that is uh, uh important for this class i mean like uh anything about the grade anything about the um anything else that you might have in mind professor yes you essentially have made it sound as if once we have sent in all of the homeworks that it's just okay there's a grade you're done yes. um that's essentially it that's essentially it 
Okay, and I, I'm, I'm feeding my own paranoia here at this point, but there was only five homeworks in total, right? Uh, yes. So if you've done five homeworks, I think this is a pretty, pretty good, pretty good thing. Is that? If you want more, I can give you another one. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I wouldn't mind trying to do something with the traveling salesman, but obviously, it's not going to be a homework at this point. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I think it's it's late in, in the season. So, I mean, you're done with it. it was there was enough homeworks? You remember the discussion like uh, a couple of weeks ago when I asked you how many more homeworks you want and. Almost everybody said that we, we want just one more, and that's it. So I followed your advice. I mean, I wasn't going to be uh, the voice of dissent. Sorry? I wasn't going to be the voice of dissent. <laughs> I see. Uh, you know, you um, make everybody happy, huh? Um, professor? Yes. OK, now I'm being paranoid. Uh, I'm counting six homeworks. We had the intro just the setup homework the recursion the schrodinger equation lda vegas and wang land now right uh, let me check yes no i don't remember either <laughs> one students i have some uh Uh, yeah, this, the first homework was not due per se. So, so the first so one was Mandelbrot, which was just uh, uh, some of you submitted, but others didn't. And that's okay. okay. I said it doesn't matter. Got so it. then it was Basel with recursion, then it was hydrogen atom, then it was DFT for atom, then it was Vegas. And finally, there's one more, which I didn't put it here yet. Uh, uh, that was one Glanda, isn't it? Got it. Perfect. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. And the first one was kind of uh, yes or no, isn't it? All right, great, thank you. Yeah, now in terms of who has missed the assignment, so uh, I mean this is not completely updated yet. I got a couple of uh, a couple of uh, homeworks afterwards, but uh, I mean most of you have done the bulk of the bulk of the assignments here. I mean you see it on the screen, isn't it? So not that much missing. Okay, so in some sense, uh, uh, looks like you're doing pretty well. Uh, yes? Mm, the DFT for Adam, is that the, the LDA one? Yes, DFT for Adam is LDA for Adam, yes. All right, thanks. LDA for Adam, there was hydrogen atom first, then was LDA for Atom, then it was Vegas, and then now it's one, one blunder, which I didn't add yet. But. Uh, one plan, though, I mean, not so many people submitted yet. So I think that this is something that you should do uh, as soon as you can. Um, yeah. So in the last few minutes, so how much how much do we have uh, time left? Uh, oh, only ten minutes. Hmm. Okay. Well, I can still show you something that I prepared. So I prepared for today diffusion limit ag aggregation. So uh, it's, uh, it's here uh, only on the website. I didn't put it on GitHub yet. Um, it's on the website. You can click on diffusion limit aggregation. You can download the code and you can run it. And then I will give you a little bit of uh, explanation about this. So the code is called DLA2 and I just created Python script, not Jupyter Notebook. And the reason for this is because we're using this animation. Animation in Jupyter Notebook somehow doesn't work so well. Now, what do you see on the screen? You see it? Fractal. Fractal, yes. Fractal. So uh, this is called fractal growth, doesn't it? Or diffusion limit ag aggregation, some people call it. Uh, so what happens is that uh, um, this is a model of, um, uh, of growth of, uh, let's say, uh, snowflakes or growth of, um, uh, well, bacteria. Uh, many physical systems are growing in this principle, which is called diffusion limit aggregation. Uh, now, of course, this is only an approximation for the physical growth, but it's pretty, pretty reasonable in uh, many uh, uh, realistic systems. And the way uh, this, this algorithm works is actually pretty simple. Uh, we, start, um, we start with um, uh, 
removing random walker from anywhere on the boundary. So we start on the boundary, either on the top, on the bottom, on the left, or on the right. And then we allow the random walker to move around uh, randomly again, either left or right or up or down, until it finds uh, until it finds uh, uh, this uh, uh, this um, fractal. And once it finds something as part of the fractal, it attaches to itself. So it gets glued. And then, of course, this thing grows until, well, it spans the entire, the entire system. And of course, we have periodic boundary conditions. So sooner or later, uh, the entire uh, area is going to be, is gonna be uh, contained by this fractal. Uh, of course, uh, this uh, corresponds to a physical system uh, as long as uh, the area is larger than uh, the size of the size of the cluster. Otherwise, you have a bound, you have uh, uh, you have the uh, finite size effects. So now it's basically too large already. You can break it. Uh, now. Um, so the algorithm for this is very simple. I mean, I can, I will show it to you and it's completely trivial. But um, what I was uh, hoping to explain you now in the last minute is that this fractal uh, has an interesting property which is called mass of the fractal. So if you, look at the, if you look at the mass as a function of the distance r, you will see that this mass goes as r to the d where d is some exponent and um, in two dimensions, uh, if the if the if the fractal is complete in the sense that it has um, two-dimensional weight, you would expect r to go as uh, you would expect mass to go as r square, isn't it? Because the that's the the volume, isn't it? The volume in, in two dimensions goes as r square. So what we do is the is the following: we um, we we uh, make us a, a ring, isn't it? The ring, and then we check how many um, how many uh, uh, dots we have in the ring in each ring. Okay, and of course the expectation is that in two dimensions each ring would have a uh, mass of the order of uh, r square. Doesn't it? Well, it turns out that the fractal has the property that the mass doesn't go as r square, but it goes with exponent which is smaller than two. Uh, and this 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 exponent is called character, characteristic exponent, uh, and uh, it's uh, well in this particular case of this cluster is 1.68 roughly, uh, and means that since our, since the the mass goes less than with less than exponent two means that there are some uh, fractals in there fractals which means well means that uh, there are cracks so the object which mass m is increasing slower than r square must contain cracks or holes at the size of the cracks and holes must increase with r. So clearly that's what the fractal is, isn't it? So um, now uh, this code uh, is printing not only uh, the, uh, on, the, on the display, it prints the, it prints the, uh, um, it, it plots the, cl the cluster, but it also prints out the mass of it. And here are uh, here is the mass. So we, we are basically taking um, uh, the ring of the size 20. So first 20, 20, 40, 60, 80, 100, and so on. And we calculate how many dots we have in each uh, in each uh, ring of the size of 20. Uh, and uh, then we can uh, we can estimate the mass from this data that I just show you, and we will see. That the data actually is uh, this is log log plot. The data is pretty straight, doesn't it? Well, at the end, there is there is always some finite size effects because uh, the the this uh, uh, this starts to saturate eventually because we are we are getting to the size of the system, um, uh, and maybe the first plot the first point is not so great either here. But I think most of the time the first point is actually pretty good. Um, and yeah, from from the slope here in the log log plot, we can estimate what is the what is the uh, what is the dimension, uh, what is the exponent, which is smaller than two. Uh, so, um, well, if you're interested in how this uh, fractal growth is done, I can show you quickly. Um, 
the code. Uh, so So here's the code. So what do we do? Well, um, we are basically doing um, this animation. We already discussed animation um, uh, in one of the earlier classes on pendulum, and we're using exactly the same animation, uh, animation function animation, in which uh, we are uh, we we have a uh, um, we have a routine which is called update fig. And this update fig makes <clears throat> 100 or more frames. Uh, blit is true. If you remember, this means that we are, uh, we are uh, for efficiently, efficiency, we are only uh, trying to plot what has been changed from previous step, doesn't it? Therefore, we have this blit true. Uh, and then what, what do we do when we update the figure? Well, uh, we, uh, we, we uh, try 50 random walkers or we randomly select 50 random walkers and we glue them to existing uh, existing uh, um, uh, existing uh, uh, cluster okay uh, and so 50 at a time and then uh, in addition every 50 steps every 50 of those steps which is 50 plus 50 is 100 after we have we um, uh, no, 50 times 50 actually, uh, number of walkers, then we also compute the mass. We compute the mass very, very rarely, but uh, it's a good idea to have this, this mass computed so that we can then look at the file and display uh, the exponent. Uh, so, but th th this is the, the, the crucial step is of course here. So what do we do? Uh, uh, what do we do in glue single walker into the lattice? So we first um, create a lattice of 400 by 400 um, grit, doesn't it? So it's a grit point of 400 and 400, 400. And then we put into the very middle of the lattice, okay? N over two, N over two is the middle of the lattice. We put seed, which we, we basically put one point in the very middle of the lattice, okay? Uh, this is the beginning, the seed of the cluster where the cluster will start to grow. Uh, of course, here we just display the figure at the beginning, and then we do uh, im show, which means that we are displaying now the, the figure in which we have a one single dot in the center. And then uh, the only thing that is going to be is going to happen is that we are going to uh, we are going to try to uh, add one random walker at the boundary and allow it to eventually glue uh, to the existing cluster. So then all the algorithm is in this glue single walker. So what, what, what does glue single walker do? So we managed to optimize it with Numba, which is great because it means that this is a bit faster. So what do we do at each step? Well, this is the algorithm. So algorithm is very simple, uh, very quickly. So first um, we select one of the uh, sites on the boundary. So the boundary, has the site says the size 4n because n is the linear dimension 4n is the boundary of four uh, of four uh, of the entire uh, two dimensional system so uh, th this random number now uh, selects one of the points in the boundary and then of course it, this is the algorithm to select exactly what is what is the the boundary coordinate x0 y0 there are some if statements here, but eventually what we do is uh, we make sure that the this this site at the boundary is free, that there is nothing yet there. If the size, if, if the lattice on the boundary is free, then okay, that's where we release our walker, and then we can break out of this loop. And then once we have now a good set of starting points x0, y0, or we said that we when we release the random walker. Then we walk. So this is where we walk the random walker left, right, up, down, uh, and we check if it already touched the cluster. So what do we do? Well, uh, we start with this x, y, its current position that was x zero, y zero, and then we we attempt four. Well, we we attempt a move 
which is one of the four possibilities. So this there is an integer number which is between zero and four, and uh, four possibilities are either uh, le go left, go right, go up, or go go down. So again, the way we unpack this is that we we either do x change of x or change of y, and then both can be either positive or negative. But anyway, so we need to kind of update x and y for for one dr, which is uh, which is one, and um, then uh, once we once we once we change this x and y, which we we we, we move left, right, up or down, then uh, we are gonna uh, we're gonna check if this this uh, 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 this uh, current random walker has uh, a neighbor on the left or on the right or above or below. So if it has a neighbor uh, on uh, around it, either left, right, above and below, then uh, it means that we can glue it. Okay. So we are checking if there is if the right neighbor exists, upper uh, right, left, upper or down neighbor exists. If yes, if it exists, then we glue it. We set lattice x y to be one, and we can break because we managed to glue a random walker. If of course we didn't glue the random walker yet, then we need to uh, make another step. And, uh, and when, then we repeat the steps until we manage to glue it. Once we glue it, we jump out, okay? So in other words, this, in other words, this is the algorithm with which, we, uh, with which we walk a random walker. And of course, uh, there are lots of random walkers therefore. So it, it each, it each time that you see this flash, we are, attempt, we, are, we are attaching 50 random walkers. And of course, then this uh, cluster tends to grow and grow and kind of creates uh, this uh, uh, feeling that we are, we are seeing the, the growth of, uh, of a snowflake, let's say. Okay, any question about that? Yes, sir. Yes? So with each iteration there, you're increasing the number of walkers. Absolutely. So, uh, well, we are always having one walker at a time in this case, but we are adding, we are adding fifty walkers every time that the that this um, uh, plot is updated. It's fifty walkers. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? Yeah, so if no question right now, then um, I wish you uh, best.